You've just finished building a make.com scenario for your very own business to reduce manual workload and save yourself time. Everything works out great and it saves you around 8 hours a week. But after 2 weeks, it starts to break down and no data comes through anymore. This doesn't just happen once, twice or three times, it happens all the time. And you literally have to go every time into your make.com scenario and restart it over again so it works. I think we all have been at a point where our make.com scenario started to break and we have literally no idea why. So this video today is my remedy for you to help you understand why this is happening and how we can deal with it. So to be precise, we are covering three things today to make sure that your make.com scenarios are working out of the box, that they continue to work and that they can handle errors in a smart way so that you don't need to worry about them breaking again. We are starting out with what make.com errors are, then I'll go into why they are happening and lastly we are diving into how we can control them instead of them controlling us. To understand a make.com error or what this actually means is it's basically an unexpected result from one of the integrations that you use directly inside of your scenario which looks something like what you see right here on the screen with this JSON module it is red, it doesn't look good, and it is definitely gonna stop your scenario, which is another big issue, cause the scenario is gonna break. So everything that happens after this error will not be executed and your scenario is stuck at the point where it basically faces this error. This, by the way, can happen to all kinds of modules. And if you have seen my previous video on debugging, you know that there are three types of errors that I like to defer to, and error handling has basically the power to eliminate two of them in one way or the other. Number one are the internal errors, and number two are the external errors. Internal errors is basically everything that happens on modules that make.com has the control of, which is things like parsing a JSON, setting variables, getting variables, the routers, all of those kind of modules are built by make.com, so make.com has the potential of making or doing proper error handling with those. Then we do also have the external errors, which is where make.com only has a limited possibility of figuring out what the actual problem is, which is things like API requests, external service integrations to things like your favorite CRM, let's say Go High Level, uh, HubSpot, Salesforce, all of those platforms, they, very, they have their very own way of telling you when there's something wrong and make.com has to basically take that information and validate it in one way or the other and then throw an error if there's something wrong with the request. This also brings us to the the second part, why those errors are happening in the first place. Because obviously if you're working with external tools, you have a high chance that things don't work or if you don't follow some technical aspects that you definitely have to follow so for it to make it work, things will break. And this is exactly the case, like you can see it here on my screen, with a parse JSON module. So with internal tools where things are wrong, like with this parse JSON module, where we basically expect a value, where make.com basically expects a certain formatting of a value as an input, it will throw an error because it can just not do its job properly because we didn't give it the right information. This is one thing. Now, if we are dealing with external services where make.com has only a limited possibility of figuring out what the problem is, we often just refer to the errors as things that happens within the HTTP code, which is nothing else than a little number that comes along with every request that is done with, within this um, integration directly inside of make.com. So let's, for example, look here at Qdrend. Qdrend, for example, can, is, an, is a third-party integration. And this also is able to send back a response. So let's say something goes wrong. We get responses back such as uh, the 400 errors or maybe even 500 errors depending on your application. And we would usually consider everything in the, in the 200 range. So HTTP responses in 200 from 200 to 299 we would consider usually a successful request in one way or the other, even though this is not all the time true. But the majority of the times, a 200 error means it is correct. And in my opinion, a 200 error should always be correct. However, it's not the case, because I've mentioned it many, many times in my previous videos too, that every software company has their very own interpretation of how an API looks like. Yes, they share a lot of similarities, but there are so many different nuances that they should follow for making the structure perfect and optimize their API endpoints to really have a solid setup. And this is just not always the case. So I've even seen, like here with Qdrend, they return a 200, but things break. This is just the case. Now to actually understand how we can handle errors and how we can manipulate them, where we are basically at point three, we are now going into how we can actually figure out a way on how we can come around or pass by the problem of having those errors in the first place. So if we are talking about make.com errors, it is usually something we can fix and we definitely should fix. So in those cases, like here, when something breaks, we should just provide the right information. Right here, if you're going to look at this little bubble, we can see that it says source is not a valid JSON, which tells us the exact problem, which means whatever we put into here is not a valid JSON construct. So to do that, I'm just gonna paste in a quick, val a quick valid JSON that we can just use for testing purposes. I'm gonna call it Yanis, boom. And now if I'm gonna run this module by itself, you will see that it's not successful and it does its job. It returns the bundle information. Perfect. Fixed. So for internal issues, I would always recommend 
figuring out the problem directly and solving it because that is usually nothing that causes more problems on long term when you actually work with scenarios. Yes, it might break in some cases, but that is something that you fix once and then it will not appear again because it's an internal error and make can actually control that a lot better because it, it requires a specific input. Now, there are errors that we cannot always fix as simple as something like that where it's internally, and this is the external errors. So let's, for example, run the scenario. You will now see that Qdren throws an arrow here, like I mentioned earlier. If you don't know, and you basically don't need to know for this example, but Qdren is a vector database. It basically just allows, allows you to store something on a different server that is provided by a different company, which is called Qdrent. So Qdrent basically stores something somewhere and can get something from somewhere, right? And we are using their integration to do exactly that. We would like to get something, and in that case, a collection, which is called a demo collection. We would like to get that, and we would like to return that to the scenario so we can reuse it inside of our scenario. So, but as you can see, it throws an arrow and it throws the arrow because it says here, not found collection doesn't exist. And now if we're actually looking into the, the bundle request, you can see right here, it just throws an arrow uh, and at 404, which basically is a status score 404, which means it really doesn't exist. So while this is one way of dealing with an arrow, and in that case, I don't think it's a great way of dealing with it, but it's the way how Qdren manages that arrow. Instead of just saying it doesn't exist, so it, it sends back like nothing or false or whatever uh, in, a, in a better format JSON construct, so we can actually handle the arrow more smartly or nicely, it just returns a 404 and the whole module breaks. So even though it doesn't exist and we basically just would like to execute something after, it doesn't continue with a path of executing more of the make.com scenario we created. So how can we fix that? This even continues even if it doesn't exist. So there's something that make.com introduced for that, which is called arrow handlers. And arrow handlers, you can imagine as some specific type of code that is executed whenever there is an arrow encountered within an integration inside of the scenario or inside of make.com. So there are a couple of arrow handlers available and I'm gonna paste you this link as well. By the way, the scenario, as well as the links and everything you see in this video, gonna be available completely for free directly inside of my resource hub. You can simply head over to hub.integraticus.com, get your free copies of those and the links and just follow me along on the screen so that you get a better understanding of what's happening behind the scenes and you can actually take actionable insights directly on your notebook. Perfect, so now on the make.com screen, we have a manual which is called Quick Arrow Handling References. And there you see a couple of those modules that we can use to handle arrows, but they are not all because you can literally use any kind of arrows and I'm gonna show you that in a bit as well. But here you have a basic explanation of each of them and I'm gonna guide you through all of them, even though you probably don't even need the majority of them. There are only a few that make sense. And honestly, in the first couple of years I worked with make.com, I barely even used those. So it is more something that comes out of building more sophisticated solutions for what we see now in the trend of AI where we built a lot of no-code tools or, or SaaS solutions, complete SaaS solutions or no-code tools that just leverage things like make.com where we rely on a more quality data input and output. So how I'm gonna explain to that is we simply take the Qdren module as an example, cause this one breaks and we would not like it to break. We would just like it to execute that part whenever this module exists or whenever this collection exists, what we try to get here. So there are two ways on how we can do that. I'm gonna show you first the not so optimal way even though it works, but then I'm going to show you the optimal way. So the not so optimal way to fix that is we would go down here to the flow control field and we would scroll down a little bit to the directives, which is basically the arrow handlers. And here we would select the ignore field and we would basically just connect that one directly to our Qdren setup. And as you can see, now we can even connect two of those elements to one integration. So it's not just modular. This makes a massive difference because now this path is executed if an error happens and this one is executed when it doesn't throw an error. So I can show you that as well, that now when I execute it, it's not throwing an error. It's basically still throwing an error, but it's the error is that goes to the ignore directive and it ignores it. And you can see now that even the Google Sheet has a bubble, which means it's executed, right? So this is the way how we can get around that. While this works, it is not the optimal way because as you can see here, it shows both of them as blue, which means we both added them as normal integrations. Yes, it works, but I like to have a visual difference. So it becomes easier to debug, especially if you work a lot with custom handlers or custom integrations. So I'm going to show you that as an example. Let's remove that. The proper way to actually add an error handler is by clicking onto the module with a right click 
and then you click on add arrow handler and now you can see we have the exact same directives available right here and on top of that we also can add any kind of other integration that make.com offers as an arrow handler which is incredibly powerful because imagine we have a webhook request and we would like to return a response and an arrow happens inside of it we can then for example literally search for the webhook module and we can send back a webhook response depending on the arrow that happens from an external module this is awesome for debugging this is incredibly awesome for debugging I have built insane OAuth workflows for Go High Level and for tons of other platforms using this exact setup and it just makes working with make.com a lot more fluent and easier. So now for the sake of this tutorial, I'm just gonna add the ignore module again and they have nothing to configure here, which is great. But you can see now that this one is only, it has only a border. It is basically not filled with a color, which just visually highlights it and shows it as a different module. Now, if I'm gonna run that, you will see that it still does the exact same thing like with a normal module, but now we actually have defined it as an arrow handler, which for this module doesn't make much difference. But if you would, for example, say we want to have a webhook response, so I'm just going to do that. Just going to add the webhook response here. You can now see that we have this white label, which defines it's a webhook response. So otherwise, you know, you could not even add it. You, you wouldn't know exactly what to use. So directives, I would always add arrow handlers via the setup, just because it's, it's the right way on how to deal with arrow handlers. So, okay. This is what we don't need. So in our case, we literally just want to add the arrow handler with a directive of ignore. And now you're already familiar with the ignore integration or the ignore directive, because what that does, it is simply ignoring the arrow. Now, like I mentioned, there are a couple of other directives available, which you can see right here, which is break, commit, ignore, resume, and rollback. So I'm just gonna go over all of them so you get a better understanding of them. Now, the first of the other modules I like to talk about is the one that it probably most use mostly if it comes to external endpoints, which is the break endpoint. So the break endpoint is incredibly powerful if it comes to external integrations or external errors where it's not directly down to us to actually fix it because we provide the real data. But let's say, for example, the external service has an error or it, it has like a something doesn't work on their servers and the servers are down and we might have to just try it in the future. In that case, the error module would be great. So for Qdrend, we already know now it just always throws an error that if it doesn't exist, so we can just ignore it. But let's say Google Sheets, Google Sheets, great. It usually has a very high uptime. It basically is never down, but the possibility is still there that even Google Sheets might break. If some parts of the internet get down or go down or some servers don't work, it can still throw an arrow. And the last you want is that whenever an arrow comes out, the scenario stops and everything else gets lost or just doesn't get processed the right way. So for that, we have the arrow or the break module. And the break module is super powerful because I'm gonna show you once we're adding that. When we add the break module, now when clicking on the module, we have a couple of settings available as you can see here. The first one is automatically complete execution, which we wanna set to yes, because it allows us to do some interval checks on that specific integration, which is really awesome. So here we can define a number of attempts and we can set an interval. So now imagine that what this does is that if this integration fails, we can have the break module mo try multiple times again and again to send that information to Google Sheets. So what that, what that means is that even though Google Sheets is maybe down, we can set this to, for example, let's say five attempts in with an interval of 30 minutes. So even that after 30 minutes, it's still not updated. So that means that even after 30 minutes, we basically try to send again the information to Google Sheets. And then if the error still happens, we're gonna just deduct the attempts automatically. And we basically just try the thing again after 30 minutes. So it is just the possibility of repetitively trying to send that information to Google Sheets until it works or until the number of attempts run out. So this is incredibly powerful because Thanks to this, even though there is an error that maybe happens with, with Google Sheets and which sometimes happens with some service providers, especially the ones that are not that big and that don't have crazy SLAs or, or just like uptime of their services. In that case, it makes sense to have a break module that can just try over and over again to send that information if it doesn't work for a given amount of attempts. Now, in order for that to work, there's one more thing you need to do. If you really want to use that, you need to go down here to the settings of your scenario and you need to activate this um, allow storing of incomplete executions. So this basically stores a copy of that incomplete execution and it tries it over and over again. This is really important and it allows you as well to visually then see it when you go back to the overview of the scenario, you can see that execution and where exactly it is in that, in that loop. So you can just see that it's still there and it's still running. Yeah, and this is, this is basically everything about the break module. What it basically does is it just helps you to go over and over that module again, and it can then complete that execution by itself, which in my opinion is really powerful. So 
This one, by the way, makes mostly sense if you work with external services. So let's say with Google Sheets, with any kind of API calls, HTTP calls, maybe even repo calls if they don't send you back a proper format. Sometimes even repo calls send you back a status code. So that status code is what, I mean, mostly they send you back a status code and you should sometimes validate the status code if it's important enough. In most cases, I know we don't do it because there's no error happening out anyway, but it still makes sense to just check against status codes and then basically just execute something like the break module after that. Then the next module I would like to show you is the comment module, which you will find also in the directives right here. Comment module, honestly, I barely use it. I'm pretty sure you also barely use it because what the comment module does is it basically submits information of asset modules until the point of execution. This doesn't make much sense if you don't know about it, but you can imagine that uh, make.com, for example, has internal tools like their database updates. So you have, you have as well like data stores here and those stores, they can basically update information. And with a comment module that in case something goes wrong somewhere in the scenario, make.com ba can basically automatically revert some information of those data stores or asset modules and then basically uh, just remove it. So like nothing happened. The comment module allows you to basically just commit all of that information and still submit it to make.com so that it is saved directly inside of make.com. Like I mentioned, for most of those cases, especially if you work only with formatting and external API endpoints, it usually doesn't matter. In that case, you probably never need the comment module in the first place. So another module that I would like to show you is the resume module, which you can find right here under the ignore. So ignore is basically what we already checked, right? So the resume module is something a bit more advanced, but what it basically does is it allows you to define some alternative fallback values for that field. So let's say, let's say for example, Google Sheets fails or something goes wrong and we still would like to just continue the execution. We can just set up some static values based on whatever comes back from Google Sheets usually. And we still continue with those static values instead of waiting for Google Sheets to actually send real information back. There are only very, very few use cases in that it makes sense to have something like that. So I think mostly you will probably not need that. But just imagine that it's like a mapping or like a fallback field that can still continue executing that whole scenario, but just with a predefined information that you set inside of the resume module. Now there's one more module that I would like to talk about, which we can also see in the directives down here, which is called rollback. And honestly, rollback is something that you probably never need. I, I don't think, or like not never, but I assume in 99.9% .9 of the cases, you don't need that module. Because what that does is it basically just rolls back those asset elements. So inside of make, like I mentioned, you have the data stores, you can update information. Everything that is asset, from like a, a trigger perspective or like a mod, an integration perspective will just be reverted whenever something fails. This is the main purpose of this whole thing. So in my opinion, I swear, I, I think myself, I have maybe, I have never really used it in any kind of integration, but uh, I, I assume you neither, but it only makes sense for asset modules. That is the most important thing to mention. And by the way, if you are keen about that, you will also find more details about all of them directly inside here. So in the quick error handling reference, you will also have more details by just clicking on one of those and you can then read through the manual of how these error handlers work in detail if you wanna go through them. Even though I think what I gave you right now is probably like a standard explanation or like a, an overview so you have a better understanding of what they actually do in the first place. And with that, we are already at the end of my tutorial. I hope this really gave you a better understanding of how you can handle errors efficiently. One more tip that I can give you along the way is that whenever you wanna deal with errors, I suggest to only use error handler modu modules on external API endpoints where you exactly know that they have a high possibility of breaking. So for Google Sheets, for example, I barely use it. We sometimes do use it in some specific cases where we have cross updates from a lot of different platforms where it sometimes can cause issues. But in most cases, I suggest you to only use it on external modules that can cause problems. Like here, for example, the ignore module is great, but I would never use a break module on that one because I know probably that this ignore module is already more than sufficient. So it makes more sense to just check against that and then continue executing it from there. And even in case there would still be some kind of error, I could probably just add the same module over after again, and I can just do the same recall in case something goes wrong. So you can always build alternative pathways for the exact same things to just limit those errors again. But like I mentioned, this is probably in less than 0.1% of all the scenarios the case. So with the knowledge you have now, you're probably able to just build scenarios that work a little more fluently and they probably don't run into kind of worse errors. So by just using something like the break module on external integrations that maybe not even directly have an integration with make.com, but where you just use the HTTP module. For those, it makes sense to just add an error handler with a break module where you can just retry the retry sending the data a couple of times until it is sent and then basically just continues processing the scenario. I hope that was helpful for you so far. I know there's a lot of information in it. If you have questions, again, you're most welcome to drop them below in the comments. Thanks for watching and see you next time.